Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden on Friday, the 28th of February, 2020. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. Glad you're here to join us. We've got lots to talk about. Obviously, chaos is going on in the world. Who better to listen to chaos from than the, the guys at Anglican Unscripted? Before we get started, you need to click the like button uh, so that the algorithms at YouTube and Facebook know that this is a really cool show and you think it's cool and you think it's cool because you click the like up button. We need you to go to the comment section, which everybody seems to love the comment section. We love that you love the comment section. It's just amazing the breadth of, of knowledge that goes on there uh, after the show is uploaded. Need you to subscribe. If you have not subscribed yet, you click that little red rectangle. Out comes the bell. You click the bell. And if everything goes right, you will be notified if there's a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. We also have a synced up podcast available. If you go to the YouTube show notes for each episode, at the very bottom, there's a link to the podcast. You click on that and you can listen to Kevin, Gavin, and George on the way to work each day. Well, not each day, we're twice a week. Twice a week, like I said, not each day. All right, gentlemen, we have a lot of news to cover. I wrote down three topics. Coronavirus, Uganda consecration, and revival. So let's start off quickly with the uh, the, the coronavirus. Uh, if you watch news, if you watch, uh, read the newspapers, if you're online at all on Facebook, the latest thing to be absolutely frightened of in a physical, financial, spiritual way is called the coronavirus. It started off in a small town in China and it's slowly uh, encapsulating the world. It's now even in uh, the United States of America. The problem with coronavirus is it has such a long incubation period. Uh, you can go 14 days, 21 days before you show any symptoms. That makes it very difficult to block the borders and uh, figure out who has it and who doesn't and to keep it out of your country. We just saw the other day, Pope Francis had his hanky out, was blowing his nose uh, after doing some services and now he's disappeared. He's not feeling well. So I thought we need to talk about this first to reassure people you know, that God is still in control, uh, that he is unshaken but to let them know that you know th this is a real thing george what's the latest on coronavirus well the uh, numbers uh, are progressing every day you watch the secular news uh don't watch the political news because that's that the coronavirus has become a political football of whose fault it is in the united states which is silliness but Let's see what time it is in England or France. <laughs> France. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Anglican churches in Hong Kong and the Catholic churches have, sched have discontinued public worship. I believe that's true in South Korea for the Anglican church and the Catholic church. Um, the, the consecration of the Episcopal Bishop of Taiwan was uh, in doubt, and then they decided to go through it, go through with it anyway, but they had a reduced congregation. The <laughs> I hope he didn't get sick. But keep going, George. <laughs> the, vi the virus is spreading. It's now made its way. Italy is the epicenter of the in Europe. Europe. Pope Francis attended, <laughs> and uh, the next day came down with an undisclosed minor illness. He may or may not have coronavirus. It hasn't really hit Rome yet. It's in northern Italy at this time. But there's a great deal of fear and panic. I know I have an older congregation in Florida. We have a number of nursing homes. We have many people with compromised immune systems, the sort of people who die from the flu or pneumonia anyway. And healthy adults are, as the news reports, not particularly at risk, more at risk than they would be for any other virus. But the, uh, old, the, the, the older community, very young, the very old, the very sick, need to be very careful and it's uh, causing the stock market to crash. 
Yeah. It, it's interesting because this is not a virus like you see in the movies where you turn into zombies. That's that's the best virus where somebody gets bit and they turn into a zombie or like contagion where 80% of the people who are infected die. Uh, I'm just going through all the different movies in my head. This is a, uh, a virus that is probably one or 2% worse than the flu in morbidity uh, statistically, which is bad. I mean, if you take 2% of 7 billion, that's 140 million people that will you know have a morbid reaction to the flu if this goes in a completely international style. I mean, that's a reality and that would be very taxing on the healthcare system. Our healthcare system is set up to uh, be proactive, but it doesn't really react well to uh, a pandemic in any way, shape or form in any country. Uh, China did their best to stop it and they weren't able to. It, it breached the borders and now there's a flow over and in, uh, into every country. And now all we do is live in fear. And uh, living in fear is not a good way to go, Gavin, is it? Well, <laughs> I don't want to upset everybody, but <clears throat> let me take a different angle for the moment. Um, uh, there are two kinds of fear, Kevin, if mm -hmm. I'm going to answer your question. Um, there's, there's, there's anxiety and there's holy fear. So we should live in, in holy fear, in apprehension of our death. And the great thing about Lent is we're supposed to be preparing for our death. So it strikes me that coronavirus is a wonderful tool for evangelism. Guys, you're all going to die. You better die on the right side of Jesus, not on the wrong side of Jesus. Um, I, 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 I thought it was very sweet the way you began by saying God's in control, but um, I think it's more theologically problematic than that. I've, I've been listening afresh to remind myself about the Marian apparitions during this century. And, and essentially, I, I don't want to tax people's patience, but... Um, one of the things that said is, if you don't repent, you're in trouble. You're living in a way that's really bad for you. It's bad for the earth. It's bad for your culture. It's bad for your families. If you don't repent, you'll get into trouble. I still think that's that's part of the gospel. <laughs> part of the gospel is to say, you're not following in the way that Christ came to show us. And if you go that way, it won't work out well for you. I don't think we should be saying to people, don't worry about the virus God's in control, he'll look after you. The fact is, you're all going to die, and you better repent soon. And if you repent soon, you can face the coronavirus with confidence. It will carry you into the arms of Jesus with a smile, instead of carry you to the foot of judgment without a hope. And so um, the fact is, we are going to die. And we could die tomorrow, or 10 years' time, or 20 years' time. I, I think we should man up and tell people that uh, in the face of, of death, an apprehension which has been heightened by the possible pandemic you better get right with god jesus is the only way let's let's be brave and tell them no i i i, I want to agree real quick with gavin that um this is an opportunity for the church i George? don't no i don't agree i i think uh, no theologically i agree okay. pastorally i don't think this is an effective way of doing things uh, remind, this, uh, I'm, I may be the greatest fool out there, but this reminds me of the Y2K panic, which made uh, Kevin a millionaire uh, in his technical <laughs> business. <laughs> but I do the, well. uh, But the, uh, if we have all this great hullabaloo about the end is near, repent, uh, pay strict attention to the lesson from Joel on Ash Wednesday that uh, turn around the... Uh, before it's too late, repent. The Lord is, is long-suffering, full of loving kindness, if you repent. Now, what happens for the 98% of the people who survive? Will that move them any further along in their faith? Or will it say, well, I survived that bullet, and uh, they go back into the hedonistic lifestyle? I, so I'm not disagreeing with you, Gavin, but I'm just saying that unless you have a an elderly congregation in Florida where we're all going to die anyway within the next month from other things. I, I, I think that I, I think that uh, using these sorts of events can have a boomerang effect because the majority of people will survive. Well, over the last 2,000 years, the church has been a, a, a place where people go when they're terrified, when they're scared. 
Look at after 9-11, churches are full. After, uh, you know, all these little conflicts we've had and diseases and the Spanish flu, people fill the churches looking for answers. And this, I think that the church can provide an answer and a comfort. This is one of the things that C.S. Lewis wrote a great deal about in the 50s, where immediately after the Second World War, there was tremendous uh, return to the churches. People were offering themselves for ordination. And then we have, uh, at least in the United States, we had immediate peace and prosperity, and we had good times. And as the times got better and better and better, people basically forgot the war years or never knew them. So that I, 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 I just don't think that the carrot and stick approach, I do not find it as pastorally effective as I think other approaches are. I, I think before I make a parody of myself and jump up and down and say the end is nigh, I think what I'm trying to say is if I look back on the AIDS epidemic, uh, the world got very angry indeed when some Christians said, the AIDS epidemic is a form of judgment because of the way in which you're doing sex. And if you do sex like this, you could catch something and it'll kill you. And, 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 and we were absolutely lambasted as cruel, unkind, vicious people. And, and, and it appeared to do the gospel a great deal of harm. But looking back on it, I think that was the right message. It was simply true. If you behave like that in this context, you're likely to make a lot of people very sick and they'll die. And it's it's our own judgment upon upon the way we behave. Um, the same thing is true of, of the enormous proliferation in sexual diseases that has taken place. If you behave like this, you'll get sexual diseases, it will it will hurt you. I, I don't think that we've we've tried the Carl Rogers pastoral approach to society, saying God wants to love you and be nice to you and be a father Christmas to you and, and all will be well. Um, but but uh, and there's an element in which God, the merciful Father, is merciful as well as just. But He's also just. We haven't we haven't done very much about the justice of God, about what happens when you break the rules. As 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 children, if they don't look but dash out into the road, dice with death. And the kind thing is to say, look, here are the rules of the road, children. Don't dice with death. We I haven't heard the church saying to the world in any public way from its leadership there are 10 commandments you're behaving really badly and you're going to get into trouble and, and one of the things we look back and see is that i think that a great deal of the appalling violence and distress and and danger to say nothing of the ecological cesspit we've made for ourselves is judgment from our bad behavior so actually i i, I think maybe we should use the coronavirus and say to people you're in trouble. You could die. I'd, I'd repent if I were you. There's mercy to be found. We haven't done it for a while as a church. Society did not react well when the church said AIDS was God's judgment on the gay people. It, well, AIDS, it, it's not just the gay people. It, it, it's, hmm. it's everyone. Okay, but it, no, it is. The and, but the, what they heard was you hate gay people. Well, the thing is, they get, we can't stop what they hear. If if we say to them, uh, "You have lived very badly, and your and and you may your sins may carry you into a into a cesspit and b into death," they're not going to thank us. No one, no one's going to say, "Gosh, few people are going to thank us." But I think one of the things we can't know is which hearts have been prepared in the privacy of people's private lives. People inspired by the Holy Spirit, do think quite seriously if they're given the right information. And one of the things we know in terms of evangelism is somebody can say something to do with the gospel and it can pierce an unguarded heart. Um, I, I'm simply saying that we've, we've stuck on the kind of mercy, love and tender loving niceness of God for a very long time. And we've been frightened off telling people the hard things. So we don't tell them anymore because it'll make us unpopular and they'll, they'll come back and say, yes, but we only hear that you're a horrible person. Uh, I think we have to leave it up to the Holy Spirit to convict people. But one, you know, wouldn't it be something if some of our public leaders said in the, in the public space, actually, the way you're living sexually, economically and ecologically is creating a hell and you'll reap it. Don't do it. Turn. People, they wouldn't, people wouldn't like it. But... My goodness, it would produce a more balanced Christian message. 
It would give both sides. Well, I, one of the problems I see is the church, especially like the Church of England, has changed so much in the last 60 years. People aren't listening to it anymore, whether we're going to give warnings about the coronavirus or about their salvation. Uh, they just don't take the church seriously in any way, shape, or form. Really? This is the Church of England where every third bishop is is living in a uh, same-sex relationship and uh, the deans are all living in uh, Who are you to tell us anything of a moral consequence? I don't know whether if a couple of bishops decided to speak out with a more biblical tone, whether they get heard. I do know, Kevin, you're right. People are very angry with them. I'm just saying it hasn't been tried. We, we haven't heard a message from the church warning of of consequences of the way we live as a matter of judgment in my generation. We've we've gone out to be as nice to people, to seduce them with, with sweetness. Uh, all I'm saying is that hasn't worked. And I think the human heart is a bit wiser than that. And it may be that in the same way as the coronavirus makes people think about their lives and what matters to them, um, people are actually like, may very well respond to a bit of hard reality. And if the church won't preach it, the coronavirus will. Better to better for us to, to clothe it with a balanced picture of judgment and mercy than just to allow pandemics to scare whatever it is out of people. Gavin yeah, said the key word, balance. Balance. You, you preach God's mercy and love and compassion and you warn of yeah. the consequences of sin. That's what I do. Um, I, I, I am very, I guess, politically incorrect because I talk about divorce, I talk about abortion, I talk about all this stuff, about racism and uh, class consciousness all the time. And uh, yet I'm one of the more happy, clappy Carl Rogers priests that you'll meet, that God really does love you. <laughs> I think it's balance that you need to hear both because otherwise, if you're another Pat Robertson, just warning that... Uh, people of Haiti have earthquakes because they practiced voodoo 200 years ago, the, warn the warnings of judgment can become caricatures unless they're tempered by uh, people have the con you can't fool people into thinking that you love them. You either do or don't. They know it. And when you love them, you share with them the warnings that are to come uh, if for the consequences of their sin. Uh, I, I'm agreeing with you, Gavin. I'm, no, I'm no. just, uh, I'm I, just, I I'm, just taking that, I'm, t I'm taking that word that you used, balance, to say how very vitally important that is. Because I don't believe people are stupid. I, I, I hate talking about my experiences, but I, I've had a lot of experiences, as you all have. I was a hospice chaplain in South Florida at the height of the AIDS epidemic. I probably buried more gay men than any Episcopal priest in the in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Because that was my job. And, you know, I spent much of my time in that period by the bedsides of men who were dying of HIV and AIDS. And they didn't want me to tell them uh, the, the bromides of happy, clappy love, nor of, oh, you poor evil sinner. They just wanted to know what was happening next. Life had passed. They knew it. And they just wanted the reassurance that if they turn to God, they would be loved. Um, so it's the balance. Again, I come back to the balance. And Gavin is so right in that when you have a Welbyite church or a Michael Curry church that, cl that clads itself in the outer wrappings of revival and uses uh, vocabulary, but without any meaning to that vocabulary, um, people can see right through it. Let's well, I think, move this yeah. away from gay, bash, gay, gay yeah, well, bashing a little bit. For, well, it's just Michael Curry. I mean, can I bounce off that for a moment? Well, go for it. Boom. Uh, I, I, well, I, I, I want to talk about Meghan Markle and Harry. <laughs> because, but I want to follow the theological train of thought we've had. And, the, and that is that, as George quite rightly said, you need a balance between, between judgment and mercy. And what we got from Michael Curry at Meghan Markle's wedding was was no had no balance in it at all. And the problem was it it, it presumed the romantic love would continue and it would charm everybody. And what we've actually now got is a kind of 
is, is I'm not sure if one's allowed to say the word B I T C H on, on Anglican Unscripted or not, but we've got you a, can spell a B it. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got what appears to be a, a B asterisk fight between the Queen and Meghan. And, 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 and as every week goes by, the, the acrimony between what looks like two powerful women is deepening. And I, I just want to phone Michael Curry up and say, what bit of your sermon related to anything that's going on in this public disaster of, of, of uh, incontinent and unsanctified emotions and pride? And the answer is none of it did. Now, the, the reason I'm saying that is because you know, the curry will be approach, romantic love, nice feelings and niceness will, will carry you through on a, uh, on a surge of, of cheerfulness is, is deeply untrue. And um, with the caveat that we mustn't allow our fear and resentment of church to color the way we tell people about judgment, or, or they will hear that it's an act of, you know, we're using judgment as an act of emotional vengeance. We've been cast out for, for so long now, you know, you see how you enjoy getting it in the neck. People are very, very, oh, they're very sensitive to hearing that, I agree. But if we can say things with a pure heart, we need to put both sides of the coin. And, and I, the only thing I'm saying at the moment is that, that I'm not suggesting people go around and behave like Pat Robinson. I, I'm, I'm after that balance that George talked about. It would be good to hear from the church the fact that we live in a dangerous world where we're going to die quite soon and we need to get right with God and Jesus is the only way of doing it. But, but George, you may do this in your sermons. We need to have more of your sermons online. I don't think many of my colleagues in the Church of England or even though the Catholic Church do it. The, the, the current, uh, we've had Michael Curry in the United States go on sort of an evangelism tour. And he came to Central Florida for a diocesan mm -hmm. convention uh, January of last year, not this January, the previous January. And I had to leave in the middle of his service because it just was so discouraging to me. And I looked around and there were two, 3,000 people, it was built as a big revival, and Curry was doing an act. And I had to ask myself, was I jealous? Was I being mean? Why was I responding negatively to what Michael Curry was doing? And then after it was over, I heard people uh, saying, oh, how wonderful it was. And then I looked and I had some very good friends, lay and clergy who are spiritually mature. And we all basically came to the same, same response. This man is play acting. He's using the trope of being a black revivalist minister in the American experience, throwing out the words of love, but these love that he's talking about, has it's, his, it's like the love that you get when you watch one of these 1980s, 1990s Hugh Grant movies and think that that's what romantic love is about. It's so far from being anywhere close to what the true love and power of life in Christ is. It's well, not emotionalism. Emotionalism is the response to the love. It's not what you start with to get love. And this is how, this is how, uh, for at least in Michael Curry's sense, you have this fake manufactured emotionalism that has converts nobody and just entertains people and makes them think, oh, how with it and woke, look, we have our, uh, we're, we're, ha look, see, we're Episcopalian, we're having our revival too, when it's nowhere near what revival is. Or you have the Welby version, which is uh, going to Greenbelt and these other festivals and being rather diffident and modest and saying things that knock the church's traditional teachings in order to be with it and impress the 20-year-olds. Well, that's exactly right, because the Canadian church, the American Episcopal Church, the Church of England, and much of Europe has replaced the words of love and the Eucharist and all that with virtual signaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the new... A uh, definition of God's love is virtue signaling. We need to react to the climate emergency. We need to react to whatever the virtual signal of the day is. And that's the new love within the church. And we as uh, Orthodox need to stand up to that and say, that's not love. That's I not God's love. That's not the love of the gospel. That's not the love of Christ. I'm going to be unkind, so you can comment and I will agree with you anyway. But as I look at people ranging from Greta Thunberg to Rose Hudson Wilkes, who basically hector us 
and they're trying to tell us to do the good and do the love, but there is no love, as I understand love, of the love of Christ in their warnings. It's, it is entirely, uh, I don't want to say wickedness, because I, that would then imply that they are personally wicked, and I'm not doing that. But, they, but the people who are our modern Jeremiah's, if you will, lecturing us on climate, lecturing us on racism, lecturing us on gender issues, are so far from being motivated by love that they're motivated by vengeance, by anger, by hate. By misinformation. Go to yeah. a Bernie. Oh, go to a Bernie Sanders rally. <laughs> there, I pissed off some people. Oh no! Yeah, we're not going to do politics till it gets closer to November, which is going to be a lot of fun. I love politics, not because I take any particular side, but it's just for me. It's it's like watching a demolition derby, where you get the old Ford and the old Chevy, and you just start slamming them together until one car is finally dead. That is modern day American and European politics right now is uh, uh, politics of destruction, not politics of, uh, uh, of life. Uh, you certainly see that with uh, Megan and what's going on over in, in Europe. Uh, I mean, statistically, what is the chances of marry, royalty marrying a divorced American? Uh, what are the chances that's gonna succeed with statistically, Gavin? It's happened twice in the last hundred years, <laughs> and and the outcome wasn't wasn't great. I think um, I, I'm not sure I have anything sensible to say about about Meghan and Harry, except that I feel very sorry, um, and uh, it, it, this is so many families are are get caught up in 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 the misuse of power between people and pride. Um, that that I don't want to uh, take any pleasure in it at all. But to say that, you know, I want to go back to, to the to the sermon at the wedding and say, we need to deal with life as it really is. Families are very difficult to hold together. Uh, you need as much forgiveness and compassion as you can get. But you can only give what you've been given. So you need to get yourself some compassion and forgiveness. And again, it comes from Jesus. <laughs> there, is no other, there is no other way of mending families than to have somebody with... Uh, unlimited love and compassion standing in the middle. G Gavin, may I ask a question that is, uh, and I'm not trying to be provocative, because, but it's one that is raised in our comments from time to time, that we're very good at talking about the problems. What is the solution? What, in other words, what do we as individuals need to be doing that we're not doing right now, or we may not be doing effectively right now, to usher in these good things that we speak of, what what are we not doing? Gosh, that that, that raises so many questions, George. Because it's it, it's based the, the catchment area of your question has such a, a generality in it. Um, I wonder if you want to take us to question the the the, the difference between survival and 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 um, revival or not. Uh, I I think at the moment that we live in a period of society, a period of history, where the culture has detached itself from the thing that gave it life, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and it's busy dying fast. Uh, and we're experiencing judgment in, in, a, in a variety of ways, the, the, the terrible over-sexualization of our culture, the, the, the awful immersion of our children in, into, into an animalistic, pleasure-seeking culture. Um, I think at the moment, one of the things Christians could and should be trying to do is to survive and keep the faith in a very, very hostile environment. And therefore, we were talking earlier on about whether we can expect revival. I just don't think that's the task. You say, what can Christians do? I think the answer is, uh, say our prayers, read the Bible, and go and take the Eucharist, and then deal with whatever life throws at us after that. Um, I, I feel looking at churches and the life of the church and the, the spiritual messages that get sent across that that the Christian culture in the West has been so infiltrated by by cultural Marxist politics and, and therapy. The, where, where, where do people look? I was giving you the example of a local church I know where in the Bible study, a, a, a gently charismatic church was, was slowly giving way to the pressure to marry gay people because it wanted to be nice and there wasn't any access to 
to a, to a an informed way of understanding uh, gender, sexuality, what God has given us as a paradigm for our creation, what happens if you don't follow it, what happens if you do follow it. Um, we hear no teaching from the from the people at the top. We we we're given the Bible, but it can be interpreted in a whole series of different ways at the bottom. There is there's no hard core to our faith and it's being eroded by 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 some very powerful forces. So what what can we do? Uh, I, I think provide as much of a hard core to our faith with 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 profound teaching from the tradition that hasn't changed. Encourage people to say their prayers a great deal and go and, and take the Eucharist. And then then see what happens when the tsunami of the cultural um dissolution overwhelms you we may stand we may not but but, but we're, we're not even doing the minimum at the moment i think well gavin uh, i'm going to be silly but i say aren't you preaching exactly what wesley did what was the i hope so i hope so i'm no, a huge wesley, fan of wesley wesley, <laughs> wesley was a sacramentalist wesley. And, no yeah. but in other words this is not a denominationally specific uh uh answer uh, this is somebody, I mean, you gave an answer that any good Catholic could say three cheers to, yet any good Protestant could say two as well, because just look at the example of the of Wesley. George, and George, my two heroes, my, my two heroes are Wesley and Newman, because to, together, I think, they, you, you know, you were saying balance. And so if you have Wesley and Newman, you have balance. You What what, what Wesley did was he, 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 he preached for the revival of the of the human heart. He preached judgment. He made coal miners cry in fear of the four last things. They they wept in anxiety with what Wesley threatened them with, and he, they, their hearts softened. Wesley, it seems to me, went for the heart, and what Newman did was to try and and construct a church that could stand firm in the face of social change, and that's why he became a Catholic, and then actually that's one of the reasons I became a Catholic too, because I, if you can't, if the church does not have strong enough structures and a strong enough self-understanding of its of its sacraments and its inner vitality, then it's just going to be a matter of personal personal personalistic belief. So you're you're absolutely right. I think we can look at Wesley and, and Newman and say, uh, if we learn and practice what both these extraordinary men taught, we would have a, a, a healthier way of being Christian and, and a more resistant church to the tsunami of culture that's breaking upon us. It's important to also look at the context of what the church in 2020 is up against. We have lost the benefit of the doubt of society. Uh, you can look at our audience to, to prove this out. We probably have a, a dozen atheists who watch us. Uh, we're, we're not reaching the unreached because people who are seeking God uh, are already kind of in the meld of what, of what we're, we're preaching and we are what they're looking for as a church, as a message, as unscripted. And society itself outside of this has no care about what the church thinks. The well, culture, that's true, but... but but Kevin, AU is is not a primarily evangelistic tool. It, it will, God will use it of that because sure. God can use yeah. anyone. We have anything. we have letters upon letters of people who uh, came to faith because of watching unscripted. It's weird. Uh, I, I had a wonderful letter from someone who found me through a secular pod podcast with a right wing uh, iconoclast called James Dellingpole, and he want, he interviewed me about my being cross about Islam, and it was because I'd spoken out about Islam. I'd spoken the truth. <clears throat> that somebody heard it and said, "This is quite interesting. Let's let's listen to you." So this this person I'm talking about wrote me a letter, heard me there. He then looked me up and saw the homilies. He listened to some homilies and he found himself on his knees and gave his life to Jesus. Um, and this is, I think, simply because I did my duty and spoke out when God asked me to, and it caused a little little bit of a ripple. This wasn't a conventional way of converting someone, but God used the different components. I think all we can do is be as faithful as we can and leave it up to the Lord how he uses the components. As you quite rightly say, some people will listen to this in-house religious conversation we have coming at it by mistake and could be converted on the spot because that's how the Holy Spirit works. Um, 
the Holy Spirit honors faithfulness. And I think we just or, or should not worry about our evangelism. Our evangelism will, you know, God will take care of the, of the opportunities. Of, uh, God will provide the opportunities if only we're faithful to him. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll come out of conversations in the, in the marketplace, uh, online and elsewhere. It, it, it's his business. All we have to do is, is, is keep faith with Jesus say our prayers keep faith with jesus and take the sacraments then, then, then i think you know it's up to him then to work out human history with with that but he's looking for people to keep the faith well he, he well i want to do this human history thing george and gavin here's the question does the church need reformation does it need a revival what what is stopping us from having the voice that we need to have in culture well, I would say Reformation follows revival, follows in the wake of revival. The revival animates this. Revival comes from below. It animates the, the spirit moves through the church as a whole. And the Reformation is the leaders of the church taking the steps to structurally strengthen the church so that that revival is carried forward into its life and its mission. Now, that may be a technical answer, but I, I, I see it as a two-step process. Part of my frustration with the Anglican renewal movements is that they have a self-understanding of revival, but they're not, well, I don't know how you can push revival because it's not a work of man. It, it, it's not a work of man. It's a work of the spirit. Uh, Reformation uh, well, at best is a, a work of man. Uh, and we've seen that several times try to take hold uh, over the last 2000 years where the church has strayed from its message uh, culture ignores the church. It's lost um, any sense of voice within the world. And then it starts to reform. And the, the, the culture starts to pay attention again. Well, what's going on? You know, you're not just bishops going out uh, trying to uh, collect pence. What, what's, what, wait, what, what's new about the church? I, I'm not seeking to win an argument, but I'd, I'd like to go back to <clears throat> flesh out what I was saying earlier on. I think the key is being faithful. I don't think I really know what revival is. I mean, I, you know, I know what the East African revival looked like from the history books, and I, I, I'm absolutely astonished at the Welsh revival. How did that happen? How, how can we make it happen again? But it's not really on my map. Um, uh, I wouldn't know how to make it happen, apart from to receive it from a, a gift of God. But um, the thing that I'm very impressed with is, and always have been, is the way in which renewal and reformation have taken place as an agency of the Holy Spirit all the way through, um, all, all the way through its history. I, I'm reading a book at the moment, and I don't mean to be polemic. It's called Reformations, and it, as it looks at the 13th and the 14th and the 15th century, it looks at the reformations that were happening. The Protestant Reformation was one of them, and this historian is trying to say by talking about reformation, we've actually missed the point. You know, this was not the one moment when the church got put right. All through the centuries. God's agency is to go on putting the church right by calling people back to faithfulness. And I think if we're, if we're faithful, then the, the things that have gone wrong will, will come right as faithful people prophetically stand up and say, look, guys, we've gone too far in this direction. I think the, the problem is when you break the church to do it because you then have another problem that you can't easily put right later on. But, but reformations, renewal, all come, I think, from saying our prayers, believing the truthful things, uh, and receiving the from the church the nourishment it needs. And I, 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 I go on thinking that the Eucharist is much more important than ever I guessed, and the, you know, the more the better. So, um, keep the faith, and then let and the Holy Spirit will respond and and do the rest. And in terms of how the church lives in in society. Um, uh, it, it's not up to us. We, we 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 can't change politics or the or the. We have no effect over the enormous bitter anger that there is in the heart of most human beings against God's word and God's witness. I, I think we're back again to seeing uh, to being pawns in a battle between Satan uh, and and our merciful Creator. And some people channel a lot of Satan to get very angry with Christians. And <clears throat> we're supposed to channel Jesus and uh, overcome them with truth and love. But it's going to be pretty messy, messy when we meet. And that messiness is not of our making. But we mustn't let go of what we've been given. Or else, or else we, we're, we're like salt 
that isn't any use anymore. We get swept away without any anchors or roots. Cool. All right, we got just a couple of moments to talk about. Uh, there's a consecration coming up in Uganda, new archbishop. What's the story there, George? A new archbishop, uh, Kazim Kazimbi. Uh, uh, oh, I've uh, yeah. Kal I'm sorry. It begins with a K and has two Y's in it. Uh, it I sh I, apologies, I should know that right on the top of my head. It's being consecrated, installed. He's already yeah, bishop. Not, He's going yeah. to be installed on Monday. Uh, I'm sorry, on Sunday, March first. And the uh, GAFCON primates, uh, almost all of them, are going to be there for that installation, and I think it's going to be pretty significant. Uganda has been one of the driving uh, agencies of the uh, GAFCON movement, and we just had a new archbishop in Southeast Asia. He's a very nice man, but he's not up to speed. He's not been in the, a warrior in the battles. He's not really been involved internationally. So he is not going to be, a, if you will, a strong voice. It may surprise us. Uganda, however, the new archbishop is already pretty much up to speed. And uh, now I'm basically preaching uh, to those GAFCON viewers who are watching. Here's a wonderful opportunity to restate and renew not what's wrong with the Episcopal Church. I can tell everybody enough about that to satisfy everyone. But rather where GAFCON can help put things right. This is Absolutely. a great time. Yeah. Great time to basically push back against the Welby fog and uh, clear the air. One of the interesting things about church and church politics is we've seen kind of the reformation that GAFCON has offered, and they hit this 10-year mark with GAFCON 3 in Jerusalem, but then it kind of all went silent. I don't hear a lot of, uh, uh, I'm not going to say noise, but uh, leadership from the GAFCON primates at all, especially when things are going on around the world. Some of them met with uh, the primates meeting in Jordan. I expected a primate statement from GAFCON after that saying, look, you know, you're being led astray by Justin Welby, not a peep. Well, it all went south, in my opinion. This is my opinion. It all went south two years ago <laughs> when Sudan consecrated a woman bishop when the GAFCON primates said not to do so. Mm -hmm. Not talking now about the women's issue, but the trust within the group is broken. The uh, excuse was, well, I, I didn't make, I wasn't at that session. I don't remember making this promise, this or that. But we had Sudan have a women bishop consecrated. And this front where the Ugandans and the Kenyans have had women ready to be bishops and they have held back in deference to the views of the majority. Uh, Sudan, South Sudan did this, and from that point forward, they've not been able to get their act together on a united front. It's easy to say what's wrong with the Episcopal Church. That is not, you know, you know Stanley and Tagali, the outgoing Archbishop of Uganda, uh, you know, in his swan song sermon says, we'll never accept Western innovations on sexuality. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's not news anymore. What would be news is how do we repair the breach, in this case caused by the ordination of a woman bishop, consecration of a woman bishop? How do we work together and where are we moving to? What are we mo working for? Um, I, but it's a crisis of authority. Isn't it a crisis of authority, George? Um, uh, I was watching a, reading an article about the feminist movement in Catholicism, and um, there are great many angry nuns across the world india Japan, angry nuns I should, angry Kevin, nun. I, i'm surprised I, that there is I, such a I, I, category google that <laughs> and uh, and and they're enraged uh, uh, that the feminine has been marginalized in catholicism for so long and their agenda is we'd like to be ordained priests and when we're ordained priests we will abolish the priesthood and the patriarchy this strikes me as being too much information, not unhelpful to their cause. Um, and the, uh, they, they, they are an embodiment of the secular spirit of the, of, of earth mother against sky father, of feminism against uh, the fatherhood of God. But the crisis is one of authority. And at the moment, the Catholic church is saying, actually the authority is good. This, this authority comes out of Bible and, and tradition. It, it, and, and we're going to, with this authority, we're going to see off this cultural assault because the cultural assault isn't telling us anything true about Christianity. 
and, and the, the nuns are, 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 are saying um, that the spirit of the age is the proper interpretative mechanism for, for the faith. So now someone's got to make a decision. And the problem with GAFCON, I think, is that it also is faced by a crisis of authority over the women's issue. Now, the, the, lovely, the lovely woman who was consecrated a bishop in Sudan is, is a very splendid woman with, who's not a feminist. Very capable, but, very godly, yes. But, but, but she represents the, the, the screaming angry nuns. <laughs> it's, the same, it, it's the same issue, and it's the issue of the spirit of the age against the authority of the church. Now, at the moment, the Catholic Church is saying we're going with authority. But GAFCON doesn't, yet, doesn't seem to me to have the mechanism to say this is our authority, this is where we're, our agreed authority, this is where we're going to, to, to find it and why we're going to stick to it. And so the, the energy is taken up by... By, by fighting behind the scenes, because the truth is that nobody can agree on what what the epistemological integrity really is. I mean, at least the Catholics have got it, though they're having a hard time keeping it. But but has has Gafcon got an agreed authority when it comes to balancing tradition against contemporary culture? They used to uh, always say, "Listen, more people, uh, more Anglicans recognize the ACNA." Uh, then recognize Canterbury because, you know, they have the Africans, the Nigerians and stuff like that who uh, are in love with what's going on with the ACNA and love the reformation provided by it. I don't think that's enough anymore. I don't think yeah. uh, in terms of global recognition, I think they have to understand that they're fighting a fight with a person, who, a person, a entity, the Church of England, who has much more money much more cunning, much more ability to uh, provide street cred in, in church politics. And the difficulty with GAFCON is you can never let down. You can never have a, a, a point where you're not unified. Well, the difference, uh, it's not the Church of England who has money. It's the Church of England who has the political muscle and street credibility and their American allies who have money. Um, one of the fun little stories that we're trying to chase down, and we're halfway there, is the Trinity Wall Street's handing out $10,000 checks to African bishops to help them get to Lambeth. Friends, if uh, uh, Kevin, print my address on the bottom of the screen, and so Trinity Wall Street can send me $10,000, and I'll go to Lambeth too. How about that? <laughs> Um, no, it's interesting. It, well, it's walking around money. They, they're, they're handing out money to uh, black uh, pastors to vote Democratic at the next election. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting. I, I, we heard it. We saw a couple of voided checks um, uh, in this. And can Africans be bought? I don't think so. Some can. Some can. Some can, and there are plenty who'll take the money and do what they want to do anyway. But then there's mm -hmm. some who'll take the money and wait. Or where's the next check going to come from? Yeah, and but let, let's extend let's extend this to, to avoid being rude to Africans and, and uh, um, can, can who can we be bought? The danger is yes, we can be bought. Yeah, and if we go back to the beginning sure. of our conversation, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking, I think, or we were in danger of being bought by popularity. You know, we we want to be popular with the surrounding culture, so we're not going to tell them about the four last things that they're going to die and face judgment, and they better get right with Jesus. We've been bought because we we want to be thought well of. I think we've 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 all got our price. Uh, for some people it's a ten thousand pound check and for another it's 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 not being thought to be a horrible person. But I, I think um uh, all of us can use Lent to look inside to discover what our price is and <laughs> how we avoid being bought. <laughs> Amen. Okay, we just hit 50 minutes. Uh, a lot of people there are having uh, heart palpitations that we went so long. George has some services to attend to. Gavin, you're in France this week. When are you heading back to England? Well, um, I may not go back to England. I'm going to speak to a group of clergy in Holland who are demoralized. And, and, some, uh, and so I've been asked, so I may stay here and then take the train from here to a place called, I can't pronounce, called Nijmegen or Nijmegen or something. Um, so at the moment, my plans are fluid to avoid two days just traveling. I may go straight from here to Holland. So let me get this straight, Kevin. You're in exile in France looking to sneak back into the UK. Are you studying at the <laughs> seminary now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's church history. It's all, well, it's all top secret, George. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger.
I'm Gavin Ashenden, and those pesky numbers rearrange themselves, and I think we're on episode 579 on the 28th of February, 2020. And uh, for as long as God gives us life, let's use it, because it won't be here long.